Today I am talking about multiple objective optimization. This is a very important topic in uh, spatial optimization. So far we have seen a lot of examples where there is only a single objective. Well, there are cases where there might be more than one objective. And let's look at different kind of objectives that we would see in optimization. Minimizing the cost right, of facilities. Maximizing access, okay, like in the case of healthcare. Maximizing coverage in the case of a cell tower. Or minimize travel for students who are traveling to a school, for instance. Generally, these objectives are conflicting, but not always. Okay? Um, <clears throat> so, let's suppose that we only are interested in two objectives. We can go three, four, five, but then it's harder and harder to visualize. So let's just take two. So I would have one objective, right, objective one, and a second one, objective two. And my idea is to try to find the optimal combination. Now, we don't always know. I mean, of course, we would like to minimize the cost, and we would like to, say, uh, <coughs> minimize travel, right? So in the example of school, we may want to keep the number of school very low, right? But we also want the students to travel as little as possible, right? So it's, it's what happens if you only have one school, students have to travel long. If you have many, many school, students have to travel lower. So the way we're doing here, it's called a weighted objective, if you want, right? Every objective that is selected here is uh, multiplied by weight that's going to represent the importance of that, that objective while the second one is typically, typically going to be 1 minus that weight right and so it's basically we're going to try different values of the W's right the weights and then we're going to see how uh, this uh, solution shapes up briefly here we have these two objectives 1 and 2 what happened I'm going to basically, I think the best is to start with a table. You have the different values for W1, right? And to remember, W2 is 1 minus W1, right? We can list all of them here, right? And then objective function J here is going to be a weighted sum of objective 1 and 2. What we want to do for each of these weights, we want to map the solution here, right? And then you end up with this sort of trade-off curve. What does that mean in practice? That means that if I'm trying to minimize objective one, right, this objective one is plotted here. If I'm trying to minimize it, minimize it, right, this way as, as little as I can, right, then it's going to be uh, to the detriment of objective two. If I'm trying to minimize objective two as much as I can, right, so that's going to be it, but that's going to be at the detriment of objective one. So that's where you have this conflicting objective. Now this purple line is called the Pareto front, right? It's basically linking all the non-dominated solutions, okay? Now this one here in red and, and yellow is what's called an unattainable solution. We cannot find that solution. It's, it's, it's simply impossible, right? Uh, and, and, and that happens. What are all the other ones? Those are called dominated solutions. So those are not very good, right? Um, so, I'm going to talk briefly now about how we can go from this dominated solution into this non-dominated solution that are along the Pareto front. Okay, what I want to show then um, is exactly how do we get from this dominated solution to solutions that are very close to the Pareto front. So let's go back and look at this graph. We have objective two that we will try to minimize Okay. And we have objective one that we also try to minimize. So when I try to minimize objective one, it's going to be at the cost of objective two, right? So we know that, and vice versa. The example is very clear. If, for instance, objective one is to minimize the cost of a school system, okay, that is going to be at the cost of the total travel by the students because they only one school in the you know the worst case scenario, so to speak. There's only one school and students have to travel from very far, okay? In the case where the objective one is um, very bad, there are a lot of schools that are open, that is going to drive down objective two, which is travel from the student. Okay, as I mentioned, so it's very hard sometimes to get solution on the Pareto front. It may take a long time, okay? So one way to do it is, you know, we, we do know that all of this here is the feasible space, right? All of this here is feasible. We do know, for instance, that this solution here is not feasible, it's not attainable, okay? So, we typically gonna get some solutions that are feasible, that are optimal, right? And gradually, right, we are going to try to improve them so that they will get close to that Pareto front. Now, sometimes they may get to the Pareto front, and that's great, that's the case when the heuristic, 
for instance, simulated annealing, a taboo search, a genetic algorithms, and there are plenty of others, could get onto, can get to an optimal. That, that's great, but if not, that's okay. Um, and, and so, you know, you're gonna have, a, at the end, you know, a bunch of solutions that are gonna be very close. So those are not on the Pareto front, they are near the Pareto front, and that's what you want. You want to try to populate as many possibilities here as you, as, as you can. And it's not so bad because, you know, a solution like this one, although may not be optimal, you can still present it to a stakeholder and say, hey, you know, we have this solution, we know it's not perfectly optimal, but look, this is how the structure of the solution would look like, and you can take this one and say, okay, this is how the structure would look like, and so on and so forth, okay? So that's to explain a little bit how we get there, and we're going to come back to this, of course, later in the semester when we talk about um, heuristic techniques uh, and other optimization methods.